morning. Um, like you heard, my name is Barak. I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship, and I have the honor of being here this morning. And, and even as we talk about a simple Christmas, it's, it's amazing how truly we've, we've moved so far away from what Christmas truly was intended to be. And we've made it all about us, competing with others, or even just making sure that we are the center of the attraction. We are the ones who get all the glory, all the gifts, all the fun. Then we spend time thinking about me, 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 instead of thinking about others. And, and as we follow through uh, with the message that we have been sharing this, this week, I have the great, great honor of sharing today. I'm always at Creekside. For those of you who don't know me or have never met me, I'm always hiding at Creekside. But Today, I greet them all, get the honor of being here, and I'm glad to be here. I've actually missed you guys, so I'm happy uh, to be with you guys today. So, um, maybe you don't know this, but uh, about a month and a half ago, I was blessed with a beautiful baby girl. Um, and, yeah. There she is. She is so, so beautiful and so, so perfect and keeps me up at night. Uh, <laughs> She looks just like her mother, uh, luckily, uh, and don't worry, she looks like me when she cries. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we, as, as, as I'm just saying this, it's, it's just been a wonderful opportunity for Nita and I, my wife and I, to, to evaluate and think through what our Christmas tradition shall be and, and what our family will have as a Christmas tradition. Having worked at a church and, and served at a church for as long as I have, uh, it has been that every Christmas I end up working, I'm always at church, and, and that has become our Christmas tradition. That has become what we do for Christmas uh, for my wife and I. But uh, with, with the blessing of this child, we've started questioning not what we shall do over Christmas, but what tradition shall we pass on to our child, and, and what shall we teach them about Christmas? And, and I'm so glad that we're doing this series on a simple Christmas because it, for me, it allows me to take time and actually evaluate and consider what are the things that really matter? What are the, the, the things that we want to keep uh, center and forward for us as a family? And our hope then shall be, and our hope is that we shall be able to pass to our daughter and to any other child that God will bless us with a tradition of, of love care and humility, a focus on others, a focus on Jesus and not on us. And, and that's our prayer, that, that this child will grow in a home that reminds them that Jesus is the reason we celebrate this season. The, Jesus is the one who brought us together even. For me and my wife, truly, we, had we not been followers of Christ, I don't think we would still be together. And, and that's the beauty of what Jesus has done for our marriage and our family as well. And, and as we think about what Christmas looks like and what Christmas is, I'd like us to, to turn our thoughts to what happened uh, when at the very beginning. Because the story starts with a very simple girl, and, and it starts with her simple act of obedience. And today I want us to look at what Mary did and what that looks like. Please turn with me to Luke chapter 1 uh, from verse 26. And this is what the Word of God says. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Verse 38, 
I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be to me fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Let us pray. Father, I pray this morning as I attempt to share your word, to stand before your people, to minister to them by teaching your word. Lord, I pray that you would prepare my heart and their hearts as well, that we will be ready to learn from you. But most importantly, Father, I pray that you'll give me the courage to step out of the way and to allow you to minister to your people for your glory and our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's how the story goes. Mary is most likely a young girl of maybe 14 or 15 years. Back in the day, as, as culture would have it, as soon as a young lady showed the maturity to, to, to be a young woman, then she would be betrothed to be married. And, and the exciting time that she's in is a time where she is looking forward to, 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 to meet her, her boyfriend or her fiancé and become and join into family. And this is an exciting time for her. But also, as, as you think about this, it's a, a very young age and a very young person. And so as, as we think about this whole image of what Christmas is, think about the situation that this is, is coming into. One, Mary is extremely, extremely young and getting ready for marriage, but also Joseph, who is going to marry her, is, is not the wealthiest of them. Um, we see actually later in Scripture when Joseph goes to offer an offering in the temple, he actually brings two doves, which is the, what the poorest of the poor would bring to, to the temple because not everyone was expected to be able to offer a cow for a sheep or anything else. If you were so poor, then at least, at least you could capture two doves and bring them as an offering. And, and so we see that Joseph is not so wealthy. And, and Mary as well is, is young and, and naive as well. And, and if, if we were planning Christmas, if, if you and I were planning Christmas, surely we would plan for Jesus to be born into a wealthy family, a family that has it all together, a family that has figured it all out, wealthy enough to ensure that the king of kings will have the best education in the land so that when he becomes older in age, then surely his authority will be better. But if that is the case, then we have no way of connecting with Jesus because we, we don't know whether he understands our situations fully. And not only that, think about it. He, he comes in through the weakest part of human society as a child, weak and dependent on everyone else for his every single need. When my daughter was born, I had made it my goal and mission to ensure that I would hold her as soon as the nurses would let me do that. So as soon as they brought her out and weighed her before they could turn, I said, could I, could I hold her? And then they gave her to me, and I curled up into a ball, trying my best to protect her from the whole world and hold her into my arms. And as soon as they placed her in my arms, I realized how fragile she was and, and how weak she was. And, and immediately I started thinking, I, I, I hope I don't break her. Oh, I'm going to, what, what's going oh, no. And, and I, I started thinking to myself, I'm not ready for this. I'm not. And even as we were going home from hospital, I was thinking, somebody should stop me. <laughs> don't they know I know nothing about bringing up a child? And, and I can't imagine how it must have been for Joseph and Mary. I can't imagine how it must have been for not only for this child to be at that place, that weakness, that place where this family is not only poor, that this family is not only young, that this family is not only trying to figure things out, but also the powers that be, King Herod, is trying to kill this child to ensure that this child does not become king, does not grow up and does not bring him trouble. So not only is this child born to a poor family, but this child is born to a fleeing family. And in his vulnerability, they have to live and become refugees somewhere in Africa seeking shelter. There cannot be a weaker position in life than a small newborn refugee baby born to poor parents. And, and it gives us the image of, of even the, the gifts that the wise men bring to Jesus. Those gifts, maybe those, that's what sustains this family as they are seeking refuge in, in a different country. It was the birth of a simple baby in a simple manger into a simple family that gives us a simple Christmas. 
But it all starts in Luke chapter 1, verse 28, with a poor young girl going about her daily chores when an angel appeared to her. But think about it for a second. And, and maybe because we come, we've lived and lived long enough where Hollywood is within and amongst us and we already know how angels look and we assume that when the angel appeared to Mary, she knew exactly, oh, that's an angel. Oh, hi, angel. No. Can you imagine just going about your chores in your room and then boom, someone is there? How does that look like? How does that feel? How, what do you do? Do you run? Do you scream? And, and then the angel just goes ahead and says, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. It must have been scary for Mary, standing there in her room with someone standing there telling her, Hi, the Lord is, you're highly favored and the Lord is with you. And what did that feel like for her? She must have been scared, anxious, afraid, all those things put together. And that's why maybe the angel goes ahead and says, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with the Lord. And then it's like angels don't do small talk or they don't know small talk because immediately after that, he goes into it like, bang, he starts, you are going to be pregnant. You are going to have a son. You are going to call him Jesus. He is going to be great. He is going to be a king. He will reign forever. What do you think? <laughs> and you can imagine Mary going like, slow down. Take a seat. First, introduce yourself. Who, who are you? What are you doing in my house, in my room? And why me? And, and why are you talking to a young girl about pregnancy? But no, none of that. Somehow, Mary knew that this was a messenger of God and that this was God speaking to her through his messenger. And so, she was completely obedient to the voice of God. And if anything stands out from this story of the birth of Christ, it's Mary's simple, obedient faith. If we are ever going to have a simple Christ Christmas instead of the hectic, stressed out, expensive Christmas filled with shopping that begins in September, we end jingle bells, jingle bells in every shop, and buy, 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 and spend, 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 and shop, 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 and get into debt, 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 then we, we have to take a step back and then think about the example that Mary sets for us in her simple decision. And in the example she sets for us is an example of obedience. So what can we learn from Mary today? I think Mary teaches us five key qualities of godly obedience. And I'd like us to look into those today. The first quality that Mary teaches us is that true obedience is willing to pay the cost. Here's a young girl about to be married, already betrothed to another, now being told that God wanted her to be the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ and that the birth would be a miracle, not because of Joseph. Now, what would you have thought had it been you? Maybe you would start asking questions like, how will I tell my parents? Um, what about Joseph? When he hears I am pregnant, will he think I was unfaithful to him? And... and what if he decided to leave me thinking I have been unfaithful? And, and what about my people, my uncles, aunties, the village, and, and friends? Will they think I was foolish to abandon my purity? And who will ever believe that it was an angel, that an angel appeared to me? Will they just say, oh, we've had that one before? How will I ever explain to them that the angel told me that the Holy Spirit will come on me and then the, the power of the Most High will overshadow me? What does that even mean? So many questions. But Mary shows us that true obedience is willing to pay the cost of God's call. I wonder, who here has God been calling to obedience? He's calling you to let go of that relationship because it does not honor him. It's not his will for you. But you've been fighting to hold on to that thing that you, can, you count dear, arguing with God, refusing to let go, refusing to obey because he's asking too much of you. Who here is delaying, refusing to obey because they're not willing to pay the cost to let go of that dream, that job, that position that is not honoring God and you know, but you are still trying to figure out how to get out of it 
asking, why me, God? It's too much. What you're asking of me is too much. And are you refusing to obey? True obedience is willing to pay the cost of God's call. And here's the second quality of Mary's um, life, displayed in Mary's life and obedience. True obedience doesn't need to know the details. And sometimes when God calls us to obey, we ask him, God, <laughs> tell me how this works. And, and can you guarantee that all will be well and that I won't suffer and, and that you'll take care of my dreams and that my retirement won't hurt and that I'll, I'll still end up rich? We, we want all the details. And of the five qualities, there are two that personally I have struggled with the most, and this is one of them. See, when God called me to ministry, I was starting to become a lawyer. I had a plan for my life. I knew I was going to become a lawyer for a couple of years, and then after that, I was going to go into politics and then eventually become the president of Kenya. I had it <laughs> figured out. I knew where my life was heading. I had it well planned out. I knew God had given me an ability to stand in front of people. So I knew politics, that's it. And then God calls me to ministry, and I'm like, what? <laughs> Who, me? No. And, and I started thinking about my dreams and, and what that would look like. But we want the details before we say yes and obey. We want to know how will it work out? What about my plans? What about where I want to be? What about where I've planned to be? And, and how do, does this all work out? But true obedience doesn't need to know all the details. Mary never asked God for the details. He never says, God, then you will have to tell my parents. And then go and tell Joseph. And don't forget to tell the rabbi, otherwise they might stone me for unfaithfulness. And then tell Mrs. Jacob because she's a gossip and she will ruin my family's <laughs> reputation. And she doesn't do that. And, and while we are at it, we, we keep on asking God for all the financial details and all the financial costs. And we start on telling God, this, what you're asking of me is too much and I want all the details. We want to know what the next step is. We want guarantees. We want assurances. But true obedience doesn't need to know all the details. And Mary did not ask. If, if you listen to the testimony of Abraham, for example, when we read Hebrews chapter 11 and we see the image of, of just all these great men who do amazing things, we see this in Hebrews chapter 11 and it says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Can you do that? Can you obey God even though he doesn't give you the details of what will happen next and how the story will end? Abraham did not ask. Mary did not ask. Will you ask? True obedience doesn't need to know all the details. Thirdly, true obedience does not second-guess God. This is the third quality of true obedience, and this is the second one I struggle with most as well, because true obedience does not second-guess God. I, I am the kind of person who I love problem-solving. That's one of the things I enjoy doing. When I see problems, I try to figure out a way to solve them. So even when God asks me to do something, I try to figure out an easier, quicker, better way to do it. And I start giving him solutions. Well, instead of going that way, we could go down this way and it will be faster, I promise you. Or <laughs> have you thought about sending Warwick instead of me? Have you? <laughs> He's much better at this than I am. And then I find solutions, ways to do things better. And, and I try to negotiate with God. And then I keep making alternate suggestions, uh, trying to show that I've got a better way, that, that God missed out on something. He did not figure it all out. And we do that as well. We try and solve it for God. We try and, and figure out, uh, maybe God did not know what he was talking about. He wasn't sure when he chose you or me. 
See, when Job was struggling with what he was struggling with in Scripture, he, he had lost so much. And at this particular place where he's trying to figure out the next step in his life, three guys come around him and start walking with Job. And they start telling him, maybe this is the reason why you're suffering. And maybe if you did it this way. And maybe if you did it this way. And maybe if you did it this way. And then God comes in in chapter 38. He waits a whole 37 chapters before responding. And this is what God says. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's and can your voice thunder like this? God is God and we shall not question him. We cannot give him new ideas of how to do things and even we cannot give him a way that is better than his way. In Isaiah chapter 45 verse 9, he says it this way and he asks a similar question. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him. A pot among earthen pots. Does a clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles. I love how Max Lucado puts it in his book, He Still Moves Stones and Everyone Needs a Miracle. Faith is not the belief that God will do what you want. It is the belief that God will do what is right. Mary did not try to second guess God or make suggestions on a better way for this risky venture. Mary did not try and advise God on how he can or should get his work done. She simply obeyed. Fourth, true obedience does not delay. The fourth quality of true obedience is that true obedience does not delay. Let me put it in a different way. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Allow me to take you to a different part of scripture where the Bible clearly teaches this, and, and this is the story of Saul. He has just been anointed as king over Israel, and God gives him an order. He tells him, go and destroy the Amalekites. I want you to destroy everything. I want you to leave nothing, because these guys had been evil, and they had done evil things in the sight of the Lord and to God's people as well. And in verse 12, early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. When so when Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, what then is this bleating of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the, the soldiers um, brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Verse 16, stop, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. The Lord anointed you king over Israel and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people. Why did you not obey the Lord? Because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you as king. Delayed obedience is disobedience. True obedience acts now. It doesn't drag its feet. It doesn't make excuses. It doesn't fulfill just 85% of what God said. True obedience fulfills 100% of what God has asked you to do. God calls delayed obedience rebellion. And he said to Saul, rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Mary obeyed and obeyed immediately. What have you been dragging your feet on? Hoping you can persuade God to change his mind. And in the meantime, you are delaying obedience. Again, delayed obedience is disobedience. Lastly and finally, true obedience doesn't require God to ask your permission. We all know that in today's egalitarian world where all men are equal, but also you have to be careful not to offend anyone with your opinion or your approach, and you have to be careful about how you handle situations and how you say things because you could offend so and so, and you have to watch how you're saying it. If, if you think about the world the way it is today and how you cannot command people, surely 
surely God should have asked Mary more politely. Think about it. Here's God about to ask a simple teenage girl to give up her reputation, possibly live with the scandal of having become pregnant before marriage, and her obedience was probably going to end up messing her life completely. At least, the least God could do was politely ask for her consent. But true obedience does not require God to ask for your permission. And the angel, Gabriel, did not ask Mary for permission, but Mary obeyed. And God did not ask Mary for permission, but Mary obeyed. And when God calls you to obedience, he will not ask for your permission. You see, if, if God has to ask for your permission, then he is not God, you are. I, I don't want to serve the kind of God who comes and begs me to send me. I, I don't want to, to serve the God who says, Barak, if, if it's okay with you, if, if it will not affect your day, could, could, could you do this for me? Instead, I want to serve the God in Psalms 115 verse 3, where the psalmist says, our God is in heaven, and he does whatever pleases him. After all, I gave my life to him. And with Paul in Galatians 2.20, I say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. I died to myself. I gave my life over to him. Why would he have to ask me for permission to do anything with my life? It's not mine anymore. True obedience does not require God to ask your permission. As we come back to thinking about Christmas and thinking about the, the example Mary has set for us here, let's for a moment forget about all the shopping, all the gifts, all the hustle and bustle. Let's forget about the, the pace we are trying to keep up. And, and let's go back to this simple question. What is God calling you to obey on today? What is he asking you to let go of that you've delayed in obeying? Is it a relationship that you know does not honor God and does not honor your marriage as well? Is it how you conduct yourself in your business or in your office and God is calling you to be a different kind of follower of Christ? Is he calling you to let go of this place and go back to your home country? Is he calling you to let go of your dreams? Do you need to just obey and follow through on what God has asked you to do? I'm going to put up a prayer on the screen. I'd just like us to pray together this prayer. But even as we pray this prayer together, if you hear and maybe for you, the obedience that God is calling you to is to give your life to Jesus. I pray that today you will not go home without taking that step of obedience. See, the example that Jesus Christ sets for us is that he himself obeyed even unto death, that he obeyed his Father in heaven and went to the cross. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for loving me giving me as many chances as you have. Thank you for your word, and thank you, Lord, that you desire to transform me into the image and likeness of your son, the Lord Jesus, as I depend on you for all things. Father, I want to live a godly life and live in humility of heart and in obedience to your word. Lord, the eyes of my heart are on you, and my confidence is in your word. Inspire, convict, teach, and correct me. I pray through the scriptures, and I may develop a teachable and correctable spirit in submission to the leading and guidance of your spirit. Help me to look into the mirror of your word and let its truth search out areas in me that need to be rooted out. And I may, may I grow in humble obedience to your ways and help me to reflect the love of the Lord Jesus in my walk and in my word. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.